Thank you. You can have a seat this morning. Thank you to our worship team leading us into God's presence and worship. How's everyone doing today? Good. I'll, I'll accept it. <laughs> Some smoke strain on the vocal cords, maybe. It's not too smoky. I heard someone say this week um, that uh, at points this week, we had some of the worst air quality in the world. Yep. Worse than Beijing. I think they're lying. I mean, it was pretty bad, but not that bad, right? I was in Chelan a couple weeks ago, and that, that seemed smoky to me. And when I got back here, it's like, oh, it's just overcast. <laughs> it's not too smoky. All that to say, if you've been affected, I don't mean to make light of it, right? Um, but uh, it's still beautiful. Summer's kind of winding down, which is hard to believe, but kids are getting ready to go back to school and uh, kind of last-minute vacations that are in there. So hopefully you make the, you've made the most of your summer or continue to make the most of however long you have left kind of in the summertime. It's such a beautiful place that we're in. Uh, we've been blessed. I'm Michael. If I haven't had a chance to meet you, I'm one of our teaching pastors. And excited to bring God's Word to you this morning as we continue on in our series we started a couple weeks ago called The Seven Letters. Um, uh, before I begin, I just wanted to highlight in the programs that you received is our connection card. Most of you have seen this before, so um, you're familiar with what I'm about to say. But uh, guests, this is just our way of getting connected with you. So Pastor Tyler will highlight a little bit more at the end of the service. Um, but if you want to fill this out even now so it's prepared, at least your name um, or any information that may have updated guests, any information uh, you want to share with us. There's opportunities on the back ways that you can get connected. Uh, and as some extra incentive, we'll do a drawing for a gift card after the gathering today. Um, so, I mean, at least your name, right? So you can win a gift card. I don't know what, it's in this envelope. I promise I'm not, I'm not kidding. Gift card for Sunday. I promise, I'm not joking. So it's there. Um, so go ahead and fill these out. And then again, Pastor Tyler at the end of our gathering will give just a, a little bit more instruction on that. Well, like I said, we're continuing on in our series uh, called The Seven Letters, which we've been studying these seven letters written to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. It's found in chapter two, kind of all of these letters um, that uh, John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pens to these churches. And uh, I think there's lessons for us to learn from each and every one of these churches. Now, the letters follow a similar format, although the content is very much different because each of the churches was unique and had its own set of challenges. The flow of the letter is pretty similar. So first off, it starts with this identification of the church, and more importantly, identification of God, and a very specific kind of uh, sentence or a piece of information about the God who's writing this, or a characteristic of the God that we serve that's inspiring the, pen, the penning of this letter. So it starts there. Second, typically goes into some sort of um, uh, uh, like commending of the church or identification of something that uh, is unique about that particular church. From there, it moves into uh, just a brief portion of a challenge or of some correction that needs to happen. Who knows that all of us need a little correction in our life at some point, right? Um, after that is the promise of God. And that's what I love so much about the format that these letters take is that, yes, there's correction, there's something that needs to happen, but if that is done, what's the promise? And so we can learn a lot about the promises of God through these seven letters. Lastly, it ends with this admonition, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So every letter kind of ends uh, with that verbiage. So one of the many, many things that I so value and love about the Scripture is that they are as applicable today to you and I as they were to the original recipients or readers of those scriptures. So although the message might mean something different because we're not a part of that particular church that received that letter, the concept or the thoughts behind it, the message that God wanted to communicate to them, we can kind of superimpose, so to speak, uh, on our lives today and everything that... Um, that God wants to speak and train in us. And so that same pattern of teaching, of recognizing who God is, of hearing his kind of commendations of what we've gone through, listening to his correction, and then living into his promises, I'm all for that. And so that's what we're going to discover today and kind of really take it verse by verse to break down this particular letter. So today we are learning about the church at Pergamum. Everyone say Pergamum. I like that name, Pergamum. It's one of the easier ones to say, too, so I'm glad I got this week. 
Um, maybe not of some of the other weeks. So I can say Pergamum pretty well. So the church at Pergamum, we have the church at Maltby, the church at Monroe, and today the church at Pergamum. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to Revelation chapter 2. It'll be on the screen behind me. Or if you have your phone, you can open up your Bible app and read along. Uh, We're reading out of the New Living Translation, and um, we'll kind of read the whole thing, and then we'll break it down piece by piece. All right. So it reads... Write this letter to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp, two-edged sword. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when uh, Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who, have followed, who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on this stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it. I think a risk that sometimes we run when we read uh, the book of Revelation is that the imagery uh, we fail to understand or recognize, and because of that, the impact of the scripture might not be as significant because we hear, you know, there's dragons and there's serpents and stuff in Revelation. So we get a little bit lost. So what I want to do for us today is break this down to make it as clear as if we were just having a conversation. And uh, most importantly, highlight what I think are the truths that God is speaking to us. So I think it's important to start out to talk about Pergamum first. So each of these seven letters, the, uh, the churches that they're written to, obviously, but even kind of the greater geographical area, if they would have heard that a letter was written to Pergamum, they would have a very clear concept of what that city was like. Just like if someone today were to say to the church at Los Angeles, maybe you've never visited Los Angeles, but you could probably have a decent concept of what Los Angeles is like, maybe some of the wealth, some of the challenges, some of the pitfalls, or some of the, you know, just the lifestyles that go along with that. So just as clear as that would be to you, the church at Pergamum would have just rang true and clear to all the original readers. So I'll give a little bit of background about Pergamum. It's located about 16 miles from the Aegean Sea uh, in modern-day Turkey. So that might give you some reference of where we're talking about. And in the centuries before Christ, leading up to it, Pergamum was uh, a capital of its own kind of independent kingdom. Um, and it was really known for its temples, for its libraries, for its medical centers. So it was a pretty established, well-renowned cultural and political center of its day. So obviously history progresses and we get up to the time where Jesus is on the earth or when John's writing these letters to the churches. And if anything, it's only increased in those areas and hasn't decreased. The exception now is instead of it being its own capital from its own independent kingdom, Pergamum is uh, occupied or uh, really a territory of the Roman Empire. And so Rome comes in and it sees, hey, this Pergamum is a pretty important place. And so they made it, uh, the Romans made it really the center, kind of their administrative center for all of the Asia province that they controlled. And everything kind of flowed through Pergamum. So with such an important city that's known for kind of all these things, these temples and libraries, medical centers, and just the influence of the Romans, coming along with that is all maybe the trappings of the city that thinks pretty highly of itself. Specifically in that cultural context with the temples um, and kind of the pagan worship that would have happened there. I mean, it was uh, constant sacrifices to pagan gods. Uh, sexual encounters uh, as part of those sacrifices or as part of those rituals. And so a pretty uh, not fantastic place to be, especially if you're a church. And so in the midst of all of this stuff, God plants this church at Pergamum and then speaks a little bit closer to him. So that at least sets the stage a little bit of where we're referring to. So I'm going to go back to verse 12. Write this letter 
to the angel of the church in Pergamum. This is the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Going back to our pattern of the teachings in these letters, uh, it starts with the identification of the church and most importantly, the identification of God. In this particular one, God identifies himself as the one, the message from the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Swords are sharp, right? I mean, I, I don't own any, but I can imagine they're sharp because they're referred to as sharp, right? Sharp two-edged sword. Swords do a number of things, um, and they do a number of things pretty well, right? They're, they're sharp, they're decisive, they get to the point. And the same is true with the message and the words of God. God's words are sharp, and they're not sharp to condemn us or to bite us or to um, condemn us or kind of come against us, but they're sharp in that they separate. Um, they make a point that isn't easily forgotten. Anyone ever been stabbed with the sword in here? All right. Some of you are thinking, like, have I been stabbed with the sword? can't remember. <laughs> you wouldn't forget. I'll just say that, right? There's a, a video I've seen before, and it's like on a home shopping network, and this guy is selling his swords, um, practice katanas to be specific. And um, to, to illustrate the durability of it, he starts hitting it against this table. Uh, and in doing so, the tip of it breaks off, and bounces back like into his, not like into him, but into his stomach. And then the, cam I mean, the camera switches really fast and you just hear him in the background, oh, oh no, <laughs> pretty, pretty deep. <laughs> and then his buddy jumps in there and is like, we may need emergency surgery on the set. And then it just goes black after that. He unintentionally demonstrated the sharpness of the sword in trying to il illustrate the durability of it. I guarantee he'll never forget how sharp that sword was, right? Um, but Jesus' words, they're cutting. Uh, the intent is to separate out. And so when Jesus says the message from the sharp two-edged sword, it's to illustrate the fact that there's a separation that is going to occur. I think it speaks to the audience that's reading this, these, uh, these letters that, hey, something is about to be pointed out that maybe needs to be separated from where we're currently at. Um, God's word separates us, separates us from sin, separates us from the world. And so taking that to heart for us today, and hopefully in God speaking to your heart today, you know, be prepared that there might be something in your life today or in the future that God needs to separate out because it's holding you back from the full promises of who he is. So uh, going on, verse 13, it says, I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you've remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan City. I love road trips. Um, I don't take a ton of them, but I love, you know, when you pass that, welcome to Wyoming or welcome to Idaho or welcome to Washington and kind of the, the slogan. Um, I mean, what a street sign, right? Welcome to Pergamum, Satan City. <laughs> like you're the driver's like, what did that sign just say? Satan City? I think we have the, the wrong destination. Um, I mean, this, this message or the, this letter to the church identifies Pergamum as Satan's throne. Now, to the people of Pergamum, it's just common life, right? They wouldn't say, oh yeah, we live in Satan's city. Um, to them, it's just how life is. But because of what was happening in the city, the pagan worship, uh, the cults that were there, not to mention that Pergamum was really the center of the uh, cult emperor worship, being Caesar. Um, it really set itself, set itself up for kind of this title of Satan City and, and all the kind of the negative stuff that comes with it. So again, this is the setting that the church has been in, and God in his commendation of the church says, well done. Well done. Despite everything that's going on around you, even the, the fact that some of you have been martyred, you've remained faithful to me. In maybe one of the worst places that you can find yourself, you've remained faithful. Now just think about whatever challenges are going on in your life, big or small. And I'm by no means saying that Satan has taken a hold of your heart and has set up his throne room. That's not what I'm saying. But sometimes those challenges just seem all-consuming. And just imagine what it would feel like to have God speak to you, say, well done, 
my faithful witness. You've remained faithful to me despite everything that's happened. Now, the church of Pergamum, they read this, they heard this. It didn't mean that the city changed instantly, right? It, it didn't mean that all of the pagan cults and all that worship was gone. They still had to face it, but they had this encouragement from God. Well done. And for whoever, whoever that's for this morning, I think God is speaking to us and saying, well done. For staying true to me despite everything that's going on, despite what the world says you should have done or given into, you didn't. And well done. Even in the face of persecution or people making uh, kind of fun of you or making little of what you've gone through, well done. So this is the commendation that we, we hear in this letter. Antipas, the, the individual that's mentioned here, there's not a lot written about him, and so I don't want to interject more than what's in Scripture, but he was most likely a church leader of the Church of Pergamum, um, and we can kind of suppose from what's written that he was uh, captured or imprisoned and what, had to swear his allegiance to Caesar. Kind of that was the standard of what would happen. And my guess is because he was martyred, he didn't do that. So he refused to give in, refused to pledge his allegiance to Caesar because he said, no, God is the one true God, and he's the one that I serve. And because of that, he was killed, tortured. I mean, the Romans didn't like just end it quickly. It was all about how can we make this the most painful to make an example for anyone else who would even begin to think they could go that direction. Let's make an example of them so that's not going to happen. And even in the face of that, the church remains faithful. Antipas is referred to as uh, this faithful servant, true to the end. He had a singular focus, which was God in heaven, and remained faithful. So I'm going to backtrack just a little bit, set the stage. Reading this message that's sharper than any two-edged sword, kind of illustrating that there's going to be some separation that needs to take place. There's this church that's been faithful even in the face of persecution, when facing death, but there's still some correction to come if we're following kind of the standard of how these letters happen. So uh, we'll pick that up in verse 14. Revelation 2, 14 through 16, it says, But I have a few complaints against you. That's when you're reading this, you're like, oh, man, <laughs> really? A few complaints. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up the people of Israel. Balaam, Balak being two of the, the pagan gods or the cults that were pretty common uh, in that city. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. The thought being that if you uh, ate of the food that was sacrificed to the idols, that you were ex essentially accepting the deity of that God by consuming that. And in doing so, also participating in the practices, the sexual immorality that went along with that as well. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Again, this illustration of the sword, separating. Except this time not separating us from sin, but separating us from our creator in heaven. Because we refuse to follow his ways. So despite this previous commendation that, that God gives to the church at Pergamum of remaining faithful even in spite of uh, what they're facing as far as persecution, the church is still tolerating these members kind of these infiltrators that have come in and said, yeah, yeah, we're going to take what we feel is the best of God's ways and what we see are the best of Pergamum's ways, and we're going to mix them together because why not, right? We get the best of both worlds. So um, I've kind of mentioned already a little bit more on Pergamum. It was just the center of sexual immorality. But it wasn't just like, I don't know, the sexual immorality was a part of the culture. So there's these work guilds that blended work and kind of business and worship and sexual encounters all together. Like it was just one and the same. It was commonplace, not too unlike our society today. We might not be as overt about it, but there's this blending of, yeah, whatever feels good, whatever works, let's just go for it. Um, it was considered the, the norm of the day. When we read about the Bible teaching about sexual purity, um, it would have been considered, like, outrageous to society. We talk about sexual purity. It's just part of being a human being, this 
sexual exploration and of engaging in whatever felt good, whenever it felt good, as long as everyone was a part of it, we're good to go. And so when it's highlighted, it just would have been seen as insanity to the minds of those not found in God. Uh, There's a Roman statesman, uh, Cicero, who said, if there is anyone who thinks that young men should not be allowed to love the love of many women, he is extremely severe. He contradicts not only the freedom of our, our age allows, but also the customs of our ancestors. Nothing new under the sun, right? I read that and my heart hurts for where our culture is today because of this acceptance of sexual immorality. And the devastation that brings not only to the individual, not just to the individuals involved, the parties involved, but more importantly to the heart of the, indi- the individual involved. And so this letter is written to this church where these people have infiltrated it. They said, you know, we're going we're gonna to blend things together. Because what the world is doing, what the people of Pergamum are doing, it looks really fun and it feels really good. So I want to keep doing that. But I also want to check the checkbox that says, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm part of the church, and kind of get the perks that come with that community. But we're going to take a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And God's saying, whoa, whoa, whoa. I have a few complaints against the church. A few things that are going on here. There's certain things in life that just don't blend well, right? Like, have you ever been at a baseball game and you're chewing some bubble gum? And then you eat some peanuts with the gum in your mouth. It's terrible, right? Like, I think my teeth are clear, and then you pop your gum back in, and then it's just like this weird, crunchy gum that shouldn't be crunchy. Or you wake up and you brush your teeth. Hopefully everyone's brushing their teeth in the morning. I encourage you to do that, right? And then you go downstairs and you get your breakfast and you take a big drink of your orange juice, and then you just want to spit it out because it's like this vile poison acid that's now in your mouth because of your toothpaste. I mean, they, those things ruin each other, right? When we take one thing that's great and another thing that's great and we put it together, we think, hey, this will be great, maybe intentionally or unintentionally, and then we have it together and it's like, oh, this is terrible. If you drink cream in your coffee, like you run out of cream at home, you're like, oh, I have some nonfat milk, can you put it in? Oh, it's such a sad thing that happens. <laughs> You're so desperate for that coffee, and then you try it, like, it's not worth it. I, I can't do it. Dump it out. Move on. But they end up ruining each other, right? And God is calling the members of the church out here who are trying to blend together right and wrong, who are trying to blend together what they see in their mind as the best of the world and the best of God. Let's put them together and see what happens, because both of those seem like good things. And God is putting out the warning signs. He says, hey, you better look out. Because if you fail to listen to this challenge and the correction that I have for you, disaster is on its way. Not only are you going to ruin one thing, you're going to ruin both things. And not just for right now, for eternity. And it might look a little bit different for you and I. I, We don't have temples set up, and it's not like this common place where there's just affairs happening kind of in the public market, and that's just the common way, but as much as it's kind of seated underneath the surface of things that are happening— But God is giving you and I the same correction. And just think of your own life. Are there areas of your life where you've compromised and failed to have a singular focus of God because you've blended something together that seems like everyone else is doing into what you identify as a Christ follower? And you say, you know what? These things seem like they mesh in my mind because it seems like they mesh in other people's minds. So I'm just going to go ahead and do it because it feels good. I don't know what those areas are for you. Only you can answer that. And hopefully God, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaking to your heart can help identify that. But we have to stop saying these things like, it can't really be bad if everyone else is doing it, right? Well, it doesn't really seem to be hurting anyone else. I'm not offending other people. In fact, they're doing it too, so why wouldn't I do it? And we take a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We take this thought, that thing we hear on Facebook, the thing we see our friends doing or the neighbors doing, and suddenly we have this blended, watered-down, ineffective, 
non-life-changing God that we serve. And we wonder why it feels like God isn't working in our lives. We wonder why it feels like I can't see God when things are really tough or I can't celebrate God when things are really well. Is it because we've gotten ourselves to the place where our singular focus is no longer on God, but it's on us and what makes us feel good? I mean, these infiltrators would have identified themselves as Christ followers, as members of the church at Pergamum, uh, kind of to check the box. And I have to wonder, is it possible for us today, whether in this room or in the church in general, if there's people that have found the church, they found their place in the church, but they've really never ever found God. They find this place to belong, and maybe you identify that. When I come here, it feels like people are welcoming, people accept me for who I am. Hopefully that's what you feel. That's a great thing to feel. But if it just stays there and never turns into a relationship with God, and it's just a social club, that's not what it's all about. We're not just a social club. I appreciate that you're here this morning, and hopefully you enjoy yourself. That's, that's our goal, is that you enjoy yourself. Most important is that you encounter God. That's our goal. But it's not just this room. We come together, we can feel good, and when the census comes, we can say, yep, yep, Christian, mark that off, send it in the mail. I marked it on the census, so it must be true. I took a survey, all these, re- yeah, Christian, okay, I'm, I'm good to go. But our life is really lived a different way. That's not what it's about. And so much of Pergamum and the church in Pergamum is echoed in our society today. And God is saying, you have to take a stand, you have to draw the line, you have to let the sharp two-edged sword separate from you the things that aren't of God and the things that are of God. There has to be a clear distinction between them. We have to allow God's words to penetrate our heart, to cut out and separate the sin from our, from our lives. What's the risk if we don't? Verse 16 highlights that pretty clearly. Repent of your sin, or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In other words, if we fail to listen to God's correction, when we fail to have God as a singular focus, in the end, the same two-edged sword that can separate sin from our lives and us from the world will separate us from God for eternity. Sharp, decisive, you'll never forget it. We can either respond to God's words of correction or God's words of confrontation that are highlighted in this verse. So what's the promise, right? You're like, geez, Louise, heavy-handed today. <laughs> the beautiful thing is that there's always promises of God. Verse 17, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven, and I will give to each one a white stone, and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the ones who receive it. You and I serve a God of promises. Now, a promise in my household is a binding contract. My mom taught me at a very early age that you never break a promise. And she was really faithful to that. And so I've instilled that in my son. When I say a promise, it means it's going to happen. And so now he, he says the same thing. Buddy, are you going to do that? But I know he's serious if he says he promises. So that, that, that's a good thing, right? But we serve, a God, we serve a God of promises that never lets us down, that holds true to every single promise when we obey the commands that he gives us. And God knows we're going to face things that will be tempted to live life our own way or will be tempted to grab just little bits and pieces of things that are around us and try to blend it in. He knows all of that, but he says, for those who are victorious— For those who listen to my corrections and understand and take action, for those that run the race well all the way to the finish, he promises this manna of heaven, this miracle, this gift that we don't deserve, but that he gives us anyway. This incredible promise when we decide to overcome the challenges that we face, that this world puts onto us, God promises to reveal to us things that would have been hidden to us otherwise. 
this hidden manna of heaven, this treasure of God's word, a true relationship with our creator in heaven, the promises of God. And one of the incredible promises that God highlights to the church at Pergamum is this new identity. And that's what I want us to take away today is that we have a new identity in God when we respond to his correction and his teaching. That he rewrites our story, that he re kind of puts a stake in our life and says, you are now victorious and are with me. It's illustrated further with this white stone that's referenced in verse 17 and that there's this engraved name on this stone that's given out. Now there's a lot of speculation what this white stone represented. Um, The temples of Pergamum, outside of the temples, have these white stones uh, that were set up and on them were engraved names of individuals who said that the God of that temple had healed them. So some scholars say that he's just trying to, John's trying to use the reference of kind of what was understood by the people of that time. Say essentially, you know, you've been healed by me and your name is on the stone. That kind of falls apart a little bit because that might bring some justification to the white stones of the temple. So it's just one train of thought. Another, some scholars believe is Uh, described in the Bible, the breastplate of the high priest on the chest uh, were 12 stones that were inset into it. And on each stone was listed one of the names of the tribes of Israel representing this, the the chosen people of God. And so by saying your name has been written on a stone, some scholars say, well, maybe it means that uh, our name is kind of entered into that circle and it represents our well standing, our good standing with God as part of his chosen people. The most common accepted thought of this white stone has to do with this Roman practice uh, that goes back to awarding the victors of athletic games, of competitions. And so as part of winning this competition, the winner would receive this white stone with their name written on it, engraved on it. And this white stone became their ticket to this after party, in essence, to this luxurious celebration, this, the winner's circle. So they could show up and show their white stone, and they were in. Not only once, but for the rest of their life. All expenses paid for the rest of their life. They could go to any party. They were welcomed into any event, into any building, as long as they had this white stone. And I think, um, I think it, at least that one illustrates so well what God is saying here, is that when we respond to his correction, when we allow him to be our leader, when he's our singular focus— that he gives us this white stone, except it's not an entry into a party that mankind has, can ever think up. It's our entrance and acceptance into this eternal celebration in heaven in relationship with Jesus Christ and our God in heaven. Our name is written on it, and we are accepted, not just once, but forever, because we've responded to the work that God did once and for all. That's our prize. That's our promise when we place our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ, when we allow him to create in us a new identity, and when we have a singular focus of him and only him, and everything else falls to the side in light of that. We see it kind of uh, echoed in some of our sports heroes today that their kind of this new name becomes their identity. Uh, Sean White, an Olympic snowboarder, often referred to as the flying tomato because of his luxurious red locks that, you know, flow in the the wind. Or uh, Marshawn Lynch when he was on the Seahawks, beast mode. I mean, you hear the the new name and you just, it's synonymous with who that individual is. Uh, When you and I allow God's word to really pierce our hearts, when we obey that correction, when we receive the new name, we're no longer ourselves. We're a forgiven child of God, identified as that who are you? I'm a child of God. And what's so sad is in our day and age, so many of us believe our identity is what is spoken into us by the people around us. Oh, she's just the single mom. He drinks a lot. He's an alcoholic. Oh, that family, they don't really have it all together. So-and-so, they're, I don't, they're not going to make it. They're not very successful. Oh yeah, that person at school, they're pretty dumb. 
And somehow that becomes our identity, and that's the name we think is written on this stone. And Jesus says, no, 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 I, I can erase all of that. I give you a new identity as my kid, as my child, as a redeemed individual from the Holy of Holies. That's your identity. So whatever the world has said, whatever you've chosen to believe that the world has told you you are, forget it. And I know that's way easier said than done, but we can celebrate when we read passages like this and promises of God that says, I will give you a new identity. A name that I know, that you know, that's written on that stone, and it is your token, your ticket into heaven. It's not what the world says, but what God in heaven declares and promises. So what's our response today? I think everyone in this room can probably fall into one of three groups. So I'll start with the first group. I think the first group of individuals today are like the people in Pergamum that were just living life. I'm not suggesting you're living life like the people of Pergamum are living life, but you're living life in the sense that this is kind of how culture does it, so this is how I do it. There's not a lot of resistance when I go this way, so I'm just going to keep going that way. Maybe you've never even heard or recognized the fact that there is these promises and that there is a better way of doing things. It could be today that you were invited to come uh, by someone that you care about or that cares about you, and you said, you know what, okay, okay, I'll go. Maybe they'll stop asking me if I go once, right? Maybe you're here today and no one invited you. Maybe you're just on this personal journey of discovering or maybe learning more about God or trying to see what is this church thing all about. Whoever you are, if you kind of fall into that one group or maybe you say, I, I don't really know who Jesus is. I've heard about it, but I don't, you wouldn't say I have a relationship with them. First and foremost, welcome. You are welcomed here to be whoever you are. So you don't have to change to come next week. Although we hope that as you respond to God's prompting and as you continue to ask questions that your life is different next week than this week. Um, God loves you just as you are, but loves you so much he doesn't want to leave you as you are. So it goes the saying, right? So maybe that's you. And I want to encourage you today and let you know that there's a God who sees you. Maybe you thought you're kind of invisible. Maybe something that was spoken into your life you kind of assumed, well, no one really sees me. God sees you. And he doesn't just see you as a broken individual, but he sees you as a child of God that he wants to redeem, to bring back into relationship with him. And he has so much in store for you. In a few moments, I'm going to pray, and during that prayer, I'm going to give you the opportunity. If you want to respond to that relationship with, of, uh, with God, that you want to allow that sharp two-edged sword to come in and to begin to separate from you the things that drag you down in this world, the things that separate you from a perfect God in heaven, I'm going to give you that chance. And we'll pray your prayer together, uh, asking God to come in to begin that work in your life. So we'll give you that opportunity. He has a new name, a new identity, ready and waiting for you. All we have to do is respond. And our name's written down, and we're forever a part of a relationship with him. So that's the first group of people. The second group of people are the what I would say were kind of some of the members of that church of Pergamum who kind of had a foot in both camps, so to speak. They saw the value of one thing and the value of another thing and thought, hey, let's make them together. I would argue without bringing any condemnation against anyone in this room that a vast majority of us, if we're honest with ourselves, might fall to or lean toward this particular group. Because there's at least some area of your life, if you're honest with yourself and allow God to speak to your heart, that you would say, that's an area that I need to surrender or that I need to let go of. So to those individuals, maybe you've recently come to a knowledge and understanding of God in your life where you've accepted him into your life as your Lord and your leader, but you still have one foot in your old life and one foot in your new life with Christ. And there's this constant struggle or this battle of, well, that's what I used to do. That's what all my friends or family continue to do. But this is what I think God has leading me toward, and so there's a struggle going on, my encouragement to you is to allow that sharp sword to come in, and again, to, be, uh, to begin or continue to separate out some of those areas um, that once drew you, but no longer need to draw you. Maybe you've been a part of the church for a really long time, and you'd say, yeah, I'm a committed Christ follower, but there's areas of your life that you've compromised simply because it seems like everyone else is doing it. 
You look at what the world defines as good or acceptable, and in a lot of ways that's become just your personal view, blending the word of God and the word of man together um, in whatever aspect. And I think today God is calling you to respond to his words of correction, and you need to let go of those things. With all of your might, grab hold of God as the one true God, as your singular focus in your life. God has a new identity for you, and maybe you've known that in the past, and you've kind of forgotten what that identity is. Maybe, you've, uh, maybe you know it in concept, but you've never really experienced it personally in your heart, and that's what God is try- drawing us to, to claim that prize that he's laid out for those that are victorious. And then lastly, the last group of people are ones that I would say fall into that category of the faithful witness. Antipas, this uh, individual who was martyred for his faith. Um, these are the individuals that have fully invested their hearts, their minds, their lives into the work of God here on earth. And I want to continue to encourage you to be about the mission of God. You know, it can be difficult being a Christian. Anyone ever encounter that? I mean, we don't face the persecution that the church at Pergamum did or any of the churches in the Roman Empire at the time that this was written. We don't, we don't know that persecution or churches in our world today. But it doesn't mean that we're not persecuted against in other ways. And so I want to say, keep it up. A word was spoken over me when I was in college, and I'll never forget it. And it was, never grow tired of doing good. Never grow weary of doing good. If you'd say, I'm, I'm committed, I feel like God is my singular focus, that I'm on the mission of God, never grow tired Come alongside those, whether in this room or in your lives, that need to be connected to God. Let your life be an example of the incredible promises that God has to offer. Share your story of what your identity was and what it now is because of the work of God in your life. Being so careful not to take any credit for it, but to give all glory to God for the work that's been done in your life. You can be the example of what it looks like to live victorious in Christ. I'm going to invite the worship team up as we conclude our time uh, together this morning. And I just want to take some opportunity to pray over everyone today. I'm going to give that opportunity. If you kind of feel that tug in your heart, I need to respond to this message of hope. There's some areas in my life I know that aren't perfect, but I know God can help me get there to really correct these areas. I'll give you that opportunity. But for all of us, whether you're in the kind of the first, second, or third group, I think there's something that we can take away. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your message, that it's as true in the day that it was written as it is the day today, God. And Lord, I pray over the individuals in this room, wherever we're at in our journey of living with you or discovering you for maybe the first time or coming back for the first time in a long time, God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would be so quick to hear the correction that you're giving us, to have a singular focus of you and you alone. God, I ask for the strength for each and every person that they could set aside the things of this world that they think or hear are good, but in reality just fall apart when they're put in your presence, God. I pray that we could learn day after day after day how to pursue you and remain victorious, living in our new identity as a forgiven child of God who's in pursuit of you and you alone. I'm going to pray over those in this room that have maybe never accepted Christ into your heart. I'm going to pray a simple prayer, and all I ask is that you repeat after me. I'll ask that everyone in the room repeat the words that I'm saying. It's nothing uh, magic about the words. It's the heart. When you say these words with a heart that is open and receptive to the power of Jesus Christ, your life will be forever changed. Dear Jesus, I thank you for the promises you have for me. Today, I recognize those promises. I recognize that you died so that I could have life. God, I ask that you take away all the sin in my life. Everything that separates myself from you. Lord, I receive my new identity. Help me as I continue on my journey. 
of discovering more and more of you. But God, I pray for the hearts of every individual in this place, whether they prayed that, prayed that prayer for the first time or they've prayed it many, many times, God, that you would continue to reveal yourself to them. Lord, that they could truly discover what a new identity in Christ looks like. Lord, use this church family as we continue to partner together of loving, growing, and serving on the mission of connecting all generations to Christ that we would be so quick to welcome and point people to you. In Jesus' name, amen.